All right, today we're going we're gonna to wrap up talking about discrete time sinusoids and their spectra and what happens when you put them through ideal C to Ds. And that pretty much finishes up the material in Chapter 4. And that's going to be where the coverage for the first prelim cuts off. So I'll indicate that during class when that happens. And the first prelim, in case you forgot, is like two weeks from today, right? It's on the 14th. And I'll remind you about that a few times. And then we'll move on into the material in Chapter 5, which is more about systems than it is about signals. So anyway, uh, where were we last time? We were talking about a, a different route to the whole like sampling and interpolation stuff by means of discrete time sinusoids. And stuff associated with them. We talked about signals that look like this, a cosine n omega 0 hat plus phi. That's a typical discrete time sinusoid. And if you shift omega 0 hat by any integer multiple of 2 pi, you get the same signal all over again. And those are just what I call different spellings of this signal. And that's what the book calls the different aliases of this x of n. And we talked about how to find those. So the different discrete time aliases of x of n are just, they're the same signal as x of n, just written differently. And we saw how to find those. And there's a special one, provided omega 0 hat is not an odd multiple of pi. So provided this original frequency is not equal to an odd integer multiple. Of pi. There's one special such discrete time alias. And it's going to look like this, a cosine of n omega 0 hat, or omega hat plus or minus phi. And the plus or minus sign depends. And we talked about how to find omega hat print and how to find whether it's plus and minus phi. You just take omega 0 hat and you step it down by integer multiples of 2 pi until you land in the interval minus pi to pi. And if you land on the right, where you land is omega hat print, and you have a plus phi. If you land on the left, then minus omega hat print is where you land, and you change the sign of minus phi. OK, so we saw how to find that last time. And again, this is not a different signal from x of n. Unlike continuous time, when we talked about principal continuous time aliases with respect to a sampling frequency, those are all different signals that sample the same as x of t. In discrete time, these are all the same signal, just written differently. OK. All right. So anyway, um, that's pretty much where we were at last time. And we asked a question. Here's a question. We talked also about what was inside <coughs> the, the <coughs> what we were calling a magic box, the ideal C, D to C with interpolation interval T sub S. And that was what we call sync function interpreter. And we asked the question, and this is what we closed with the class last time. What happens if someone comes up to you wherever and gives you this discrete time sinusoid, a cosine n omega 0 hat plus phi, and asks you what comes out of the ideal C to D interpolator when you put that in? So here's a question. Suppose you're given omega 0 hat, a, and phi. 
and someone presents you with x of n equals a cos n omega 0 hat plus what happens when you take this guy, x of n, and you put it through this ideal d to c, the magic box, with interpolation interval t sub s, what signal comes out? So what is It's going to become continuous time signal. And I claim, and actually someone guessed this last time, that you get y of t as follows. y of t is going to be a cosine 2 pi f 0 t plus or minus phi. So it's going to be the same amplitude. And what this plus or minus size is, sign is depends. You get up by the following substitution. You find omega hat print for x. So this maneuver. Find omega hat print for x of n. And that entails just shifting omega 0 hat until it lies in minus figure what omega hat print is. And then do this substitution. 2 pi f 0 t s equals omega hat print. Or f 0 equals omega hat print over 2 pi t s, if you wish. I like to remember it this way, for whatever reason. And then you're done. So bottom line, discrete time sinusoid in, continuous time sinusoid out. The continuous time sinusoid's frequency comes from this substitution involving omega hat print from the discrete time thing. And the sign of the phase, this phase absolute value is the same, but the sign depends. OK. And it depends on what the principal discrete time alias of x of n is where you land when you go into the interval minus pi to pi. All right, so why is this the case? So why? Why? And there, there's lots of little morals to this story. Like, for example, sinusoid goes in, sinusoid comes out. Doesn't matter. You know, you can't, there's no way for the magic box to interpolate samples of a sinusoid any way other than a sinusoid. That's one thing that comes out of this. But there's other things, that too. But let's see why this is true, and then look at an example or two just to see what's going on. This is true because of Shannon. Because Shannon. Let's see why. Okay. Define F0 this way. Define F0 above. Okay? And I'm going to let, I'm going to look at what happens when I put, suppose the principal continuous time, alias, the discrete time alias of x of n is this. Cosine n omega hat prin plus or minus phi. So this is the principal discrete time alias of x of n. And again, it's the same signal. That's why I wrote x of n equals that. It's just written differently. So in particular, omega hat print is between minus pi and pi, or is between 0 and pi. Now, I want to look at two pictures. One picture is this. x of n, written that way, goes into this ideal d to c, ts, and out comes y of t. That's the thing we want to find. 
what happens if I take this x of n, or this x of t, that y of t, whatever you want to call it, that thing, and sample it every t sub s? So we take a cos 2 pi f 0 t plus or minus phi and sample at frequency f s equals 1 over t s. And you get the discrete time signal, this, say q of n, equals a cos 2 pi times n f 0 or f 0 n t s plus or minus phi as a result. Okay. Now, by construction, what is 2 pi f0 nts? It's just n omega hat print. So this is cos 2 pi, n, or cos n omega hat print, plus and minus phi by construction. So that's by definition of f0 in terms of omega hat print. So this is the same signal as x of n. All right. If I put q of n through the ideal d to c, what comes out? Well, I claim that because of the Shannon-Nyquist sampling theorem, the sampling that you do of this signal to get q of n is faster than this signal's Nyquist rate. So that's this. And that's because funny. I feel, I've had this all in my head as I walked campus today with the wind in my face, and I feel like I'm dancing around the result in a really awkward fashion. So if you watch this lecture, those of you at home, and say, wait, isn't he doing way too much work to get this simple thing to work out? Then the answer is probably yes. But anyway, there's nothing wrong up here. It's just, it's just not coming out as smooth as I thought it was going to come out. All right, that's because, because why? Omega hat print less than pi implies omega hat print divided by 2 pi ts is less than pi, or over 2 pi ts, <coughs> which is 1 over 2 ts, which is fs over 2. And this is F0, i.e., the signal A cos 2 pi F0 t plus or minus phi gets sampled faster than its Nyquist rate. to yield q of n hence what comes out when you put q of n through the ideal d to c has to be this signal so a cos 2 pi f 0 t plus or minus phi must emerge from the magic box from the D to C, driven by that Q of N. OK, so awkward as it is, it should have, shouldn't have taken that many, that many drops of calcium carbonate to explain why the shannon nyquist sampling theorem gives us this result. Let me just back through it one more time. Here's the question. You get a discrete time sinusoid need not have come from sampling anything, <coughs> could have been found under a rock on live slope, whatever. Someone comes to you in whole plaza and gives you this guy and says, here's omega zero hat, 
here's phi. What happens when I put this through an ideal D to C with interpolation interval T sub S for any TS? TS could be anything. And you say, hmm, well, let's guess that it's this. First, I'm going to find the principal continuous time alias of x of n. And in finding discrete time alias, then finding that, I find omega hat print. Then I do this substitution. And then I just kind of plug that in to form a continuous time sinusoid with that frequency f0 in that phase. I bet you anything that's what comes out. And the reason it comes out is that you can regard this x of n as this sampled every t sub s. And t sub s, by construction, is fast enough so that sampling this at every t sub s is sampling it faster than its Nyquist rate. So when you do that and you get q of n, what comes out of the ideal DCC has to be that signal because you sampled it faster than this Nyquist rate and you put it back through an ideal D to C. Now, I want to run through an example, two examples, actually, just to make sure we understand how to do this. Because the homework assignment you have now <coughs> asks you to figure out what comes out of ideal D to Cs when you drive them with these discrete time sinusoids. So let's do, let's do an example, so a couple of examples just to make sure we get this. So first off, how about x of n equals, and I'm just picking these out of the air, 7 cosine 2 pi, or co cosine n. And what is omega 0 hat for this one going to be? Omega 0 hat for this one is going to be like 9 fourths pi plus, say, pi over 3. Okay. That's fair enough. So this is our omega 0 hat. Omega 0 hat is 9 fourths pi. And phi is pi over 3. All right. So someone comes up to you in Hope Plaza and says, all right, I want to drive a, an ideal d to c with interpolation interval, say, how about 10 to the minus 4? So that's T sub s. And that means that fs is 10 kilohertz, right? I want to drive x of n into that, and I want to find out what comes out. How do I find that? Here's the drill. So you take your x of n, the original x of n, And you find its principal discrete time alias first, the, the spelling of x of n, where the frequency lies in the interval 0 to pi. So step one, you find x of n in the form a cosine 2 pi, or cosine n omega hat prin plus or minus phi. How do you do that? First, you take 9 fourths pi. You look at the frequency space here, omega hat space. Here's 0. Here's pi. Here's 2 pi. And here's 9 fourths pi. Right? That's your omega 0. You step this thing down by integer multiples of 2 pi until you land in the interval minus pi to pi. And it, all it takes in this case is one step, because boom, you step it down like this, and you end up at pi over 4. And that's omega hat print. And since we landed to the right of 0, the sine of the phase stays the same. So sine of phi stays the same. because we landed in 0 less than or equal omega hat less than pi. And you conclude that x of n equals 7 cosine 
n pi over 4 plus pi over 3. This is the principal discrete time alias of x of n. And again, it's just another way of writing x of n. It's not a different signal. Now what? Now we do the substitution, the 2 pi f 0 ts equals omega hat print. And that'll give us y of t. So we need 2 pi f 0 ts equals omega hat print. So now what we have to do, what do we know? We know ts, we know omega hat print, and that gives us f0. So we get 2 pi f0 times 10 to the minus fourth equals pi over 4. And you solve that, and you get like, what is it, 1 eighth times 10,000, which is 1,500? No. 1,250? Is that right? Yeah. You don't know? Alex, you don't even know that answer? You can't do that in your head? OK. Fair enough. So that means that F0 is equal to 1,250. OK. So the bottom line is, so finally, all you do is you write down y of t. So y of t, same amplitude, frequency of 1,250 hertz, and same phase. OK? Boom, just like that. How about another example? I just want to do another example because I want to make sure you know how to do it when you land to the left of 0. So another example, so final example. How about uh, x of n equals, say, 13 cosine 2 pi times, say, 7 fourths. No, n times 7 fourths pi. say, plus pi over 5. How about that? OK. How do you find y of t? And, and I'm assume I'm going to put it through the same d to c, the 10 to the minus 4th ts, 10 to the 4th hertz sampling rate, whatever. So we take x of n. And put it through that. What comes out? OK. First, you find the principal continuous time, discrete time alias of x of n. And you do that as follows. You write down omega hat space, 0 pi 2 pi minus pi minus 2 pi. What's the omega 0 hat you start with? It's 7 fourths pi. That's about here, right? So this is 7 fourths pi. You step it down by integer multiples of 2 pi until you land in the interval minus pi to pi. And this time, whoops, you land to the left of 0 at minus pi over 4. What does that mean? That means that the principal discrete time alias of x of n is going to have the same omega hat print as we had a moment ago, but the phase is going to change sign. So that means that x of n equals 13 cosine of n omega hat print, which is going to be pi over 4 minus pi over 5. The sign of the phase changes. So omega hat print is equal to pi over 4 once again. But the phi sign 
flips. Okay. So that's the difference when you land to the left of zero when you're finding omega hat print. Then what do you do? You do the same substitution. You do the 2 pi F0 TS equals omega hat print. Substitution, that leads to the same F0. So the 2 pi F0 TS equals omega hat print leads again to F0 equals 1250. And you conclude that y of t, what comes out of the ideal d to c, in this case, is 13 cosine 2 pi times 1250t minus pi over 5. OK. So now we know how to figure out what comes out of an ideal d to c when you drive it with a discrete time cosine, discrete time sinusoid. Now, this extends by linearity to sums of discrete time sinusoids. So if someone comes up to you, instead of giving you a single discrete time sinusoid and gives you some of them, all you do is this, you play this game with each term and add the results together. So more generally, if you have x of n a sum, of discrete time sinusoids, and you want to know what comes out when you put this through an ideal D to C, so the output of an ideal D to C with interpolation interval TS driven by X of N arises as above term by term. In other words, you take each term in x of n is a discrete time sinusoid, like one of these x's of n up here. You figure out what comes out when you put that signal through. And the y of t that comes out is going to be the sum of those. All right. Finally, this is the last thing from the chapter 4 sampling, interpolation, et cetera stuff is spectral representations of these discrete time sinusoids and sum thereof, sums thereof. So here's the final, finally, I want to talk about spectral representation of discrete time sinusoids and sums thereof. Okay. And so anyway, discrete time sinusoids. Someone comes up to you and says, okay, I want what is the spectral representation of, say, a cosine and omega zero hat plus phi? So you're given x of n equals a cosine of n omega 0 hat plus phi. It's tempting to sort of mimic what we did in continuous time and say, here's the spectrum of x of n. So it's tempting to sort of mimic the continuous time sort of spectral construction ritual and write this, come up with this, a stem plot, here's omega hat space, a stem plot that has a e to the j phi at omega 0 hat. A over 2, I should say. And at minus omega 0 hat, it has A over 2 e to the minus j phi. Okay. That's what 
if we just mimicked what we did in continuous time to find spectra, that's the picture we would get. However, <coughs> this signal, as we know, can be written in many different ways with many different values of omega zero hat. Omega zero hat plus two pi, omega zero hat plus four pi, and so on. Others, we can get others by subtracting integer multiples of two pi. If we get negative, we go positive and two pi translate those. We saw how to get all those last time. So this same signal x of n doesn't just have quote unquote discrete time normalized frequency content and omega zero hat, it has quote unquote discrete time normalized frequency content at zillions of other frequencies as well. So because we can spell x of n in so many different ways, For example, x of n is equal to a cosine n omega 0 hat plus 8 pi plus the same phi. x of n equals a cosine n omega hat omega 0 hat minus 2 pi plus phi provided this omega 0 hat is bigger than 2 pi bigger than or equal to 2 pi, et cetera, all these discrete time aliases, x of n has frequency content at lots of other different frequencies. So x of n has frequency content. And I want to write out maybe just to be really explicit, has, quote unquote, has normalized frequency content at lots of other values of omega hat other than omega hat zero. And why is this not the case in continuous time that we have to worry about stuff like this? Well, a continuous time sinusoid of frequency F zero has frequency content just at F zero. It doesn't have frequency content at any other frequency. But in discrete time, because we can write the signal in so many different ways, there's no way I can look at omega zero hat space and say that tells me the whole story about where the frequency content of this signal is. So what do we do to illustrate this fact spectrally? OK, so call this picture 1, OK? So to take this into account, to account for this, this is what people do. The discrete time spectrum, the spectrum of this discrete time sinusoid arises as follows. So people have settled on this way of defining the discrete time spectrum of the signal x of n. You take picture number one, <clears throat> and you translate it by all the positive integer multiples of 2 pi and all the negative integer multiples of 2 pi, and you add all those pictures together. So you take picture one. and translate it to the right by all possible integer multiples of k pi. And this is a straight up translation. The stem labels stay the same.
And what you end up with is a whole bunch of stems. End up with quote unquote infinity stems. Okay, for the spectrum of x of n. Let's do this for an example. So a specific example. How about x of n equals say 7 cosine n times again. I'll use 9 pi over 4 again because we're friends with that from earlier today, divided by pi over 3, or plus pi over 3. OK? What do you do? You start with picture 1. Here's picture 1 for this x of n. It's a stem at 9 pi over 4 labeled. What is the label on this stem? Just to get your, your reality check in. I've been not asking you guys enough questions today. So there's going to be two stems in picture one. What are the labels? Uh, Nick. Yeah. Yeah. There's always going to be a conjugate symmetry between these two stems. All right, now what do you do? You take this picture and you translate it to the right by all integer multiples of 2 pi, translate it to the left by all integer multiples of 2 pi, add all those together, and you get a big old picture with lots of stems. So what comes up? When you do that, there's a mega hat here, zero. And let's just, just for definiteness, this is 2 pi right here. This is minus 2 pi, right? And here's pi and minus pi. What happens when I translate this guy to the right by integer multiples of 2 pi? Well, this stem goes to pi over 4 and its label stays the same. Let's see what happens to the left stem first. So this goes to pi over 4. Label stays the same, 7 halves e to the minus j pi over 3. And the stem out here at 2 pi, or at 9 pi over 4, so this is going to be pi, and this is going to be 2 pi. The stem at 9 pi over 4, and by the way, this stays, which is 7 halves e to the positive j pi over 3. When I translate that to the right by 2 pi, so here's 3 pi, here's 4 pi, I get one just to the right of that of 4 pi, e to the j pi over 3, and so on. So this is what happens when I start with this guy to translate it to the right. So what are we doing over here? We have minus pi, minus 2 pi, and we have this one at minus 9 pi over 4 a e to the minus j pi over 3, or 7 halves. And that one goes there. That one goes, uh, wait a second. For that first one? Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right, thank you. That's good. So we have negative pi over 4. Same label here. And then again, we go up and we get one here. Same label, right? And we get one over here. Same label. Like so. All right. So and this one, the, the 9 pi over 4 translates left to 7 halves e to the j pi over 3. And then again over here, 7 halves e to the j pi over 3, and so on. Anyway, you're going to get little pairs of stems around all the, all the even integer multiples of pi, all the, all the integer multiples of 2 pi. Yeah. Just to make sure I'm understanding this. Yeah. 
We, we are finding that as part of this process, but all I'm doing is I'm telling you this is how people define the spectrum of a discrete time okay. sinusoid. And as part of this process, we end up finding the principal discrete time alias frequency because there's only going to be, yeah. you know, one pair of stems in there. Okay. So once you find that, if you have the principal frequency, do you just step it up by 2 pi and then flip it over the axis? You have to make you, yeah, there's, <laughs> if you just have the principal frequency, you can find all the ones, all the uh, aliases, like, to the right, the ones that correspond to these spectral, these, like, let's call this guy, let's call this guy alpha, alpha star, okay? And I'm going to call this guy beta, and this guy is beta star. Now, why am I doing this? You'll see in a second. This guy is gamma, and this guy is gamma star. The, the pairs with the same letter are associated with each other, okay? Yeah. The alpha pair <laughs> corresponds to the principal discrete time alias. The beta pair and the gamma pair give us other discrete time aliases. But you can't get the beta and the gamma pair just by shifting, the, well, I guess you can by just shifting the alpha pair. But, so maybe the answer to your question, if I understood it correctly, is yes. But I like to think of this as just a, like a recipe for generating a picture that everyone has agreed upon to call the discrete time spectrum, you know. So, Eric, so out. The frequency you're giving, step it down until you get to the principal one. Step it, and then if necessary, step it into the negatives and flip every single one of those. Well, uh, what, I'm doing, it's, uh, what I'm doing is simpler than that, okay? Last time, we did a step down thing to find principal discrete time alias frequency. This time, I'm giving you a blind recipe for finding a picture. How do we do that? First, we draw picture one, okay? Then we do blup, 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 blup with picture one, and we also do blup, 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 blup with picture one, and we add all those pictures together, and we end up with that. So there's no quote unquote stepping down. There's just translating pictures and adding them together. But as he was pointing out, Ian, right? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Was pointing out, like, you can, you can, in theory, do the stepping down first and then find the principal discrete time alias and then do all the translation and get, and get these pictures too. But this is what I've settled on is the simplest way of describing how to find it for me. And if it's not for you, like, the book gives it a little bit differently. This is the way I like to do it. So, again, this is one of the ones where I differ some from the book to you. Those are just those are just labels. I'm just labeling these guys. Yeah, but like how did you get those? Like how, why are they listed? Okay. <laughs> so so say I take this picture, right? I have something at minus nine fourths. So this is minus nine fourths pi, and I have something at nine fourths pi. Right? And I translate to the right by two pi. What does that give me? That gives me this stem, right? And, and there's one out here. And then another one here. Another one here. OK? If I take that 9 fourths pi and I translate it to the left, I get that. Or I get this, this stem here. And so you add 2 pi to minus pi over 4 over 6. Yeah, yeah. You, add all, you take, well, you add 2 pi to minus 9 pi over 4. You take the original picture one, right? <laughs> and you two pi it over, you two pi it over again, you two pi it over again, and then you do that in the reverse direction. And then you combine them together, and it looks much prettier when you combine them together than it does while you're translating them, in my humble opinion. But, you know. Any, any other questions about this? <laughs> yeah, Nick? Good question, and that was the, the next order of business, okay? It turns out that there's something sacred about the interval minus pi to pi. And so let's, we'll, we'll wrap this up with an answer to your question after we take the three minute break. All right, um, Nick asked an interesting question. He said, he said, <clears throat> He 
said, OK, well, if there's infinite, infinity stems in this picture, obviously we can't draw them all. So like, what, hap what, are we, what are we supposed to do? Well, it depends. Like, If it's a test or something, and the test says graph the spectrum between omega hat equals minus 10 pi and positive 10 pi, then that's an explicit kind of instruction. But in real life, this is what people do. Okay, It turns out that, and first of all, this generalizes to sums of sinusoids. You can, you can do a sum of sinusoids just by doing this for each one and adding all the pictures together. So that's one thing to note. So if x of n is instead, so more generally, I'll try to phrase it exactly as I did earlier, if x of n is a sum of discrete time sinusoids, Its spectrum is just the sum of the spectrum of the initial. <coughs> so for each term in the sum, you get a picture like that. And then you get all those pictures and you add them all together. So if you happen to have, well, you won't have collisions. But the point is, you, then you're going to have lots of stems with different labels and different lengths and whatever all over the place, right? The picture turns out to be 2 pi periodic. Okay, that's one thing to note. So here's a fact. The, the stem plot that results from these things is always going to be 2 pi periodic. First off, it's 2 pi periodic in omega hat. In other words, and remember, these are not graphs, schematics, these stem plots. When I say 2 pi periodic, I mean shift it to the right, you get the same left. And also, it's going to be conjugate symmetric. Label-wise, so if you have a, say in the positive frequency zone at some frequency omega zero hat, you're always going to have a stem at minus omega zero hat with conjugate of its label as the label. So label-wise and location-wise. All right. Now, given this two pi periodic, we could specify completely by looking at it on any 2 pi length interval in omega hat space. And what people do is they choose to focus, they choose to home in on the interval minus pi to pi. And sometimes they will just graph the spectrum on that interval and say that's it. Okay, so the periodicity, periodicity, implies that if you know the spectrum on minus pi less hat less or equal to pi, you know it for all omega hat. So someone comes to you and gives you a bunch of stems on minus pi to pi with labels, then by 2 pi periodicity, you can figure out what it is for all omega hat. And thus, often, people just graph it. And this is, this is the succinct answer to your question earlier. People just graph, graph a stem plot on that interval. Okay. And so that's the thing that arises. Now each pair of stems you get, each conjugate symmetric pair of stems corresponds to a cosine. And what you can do to, to figure out, like when you put, say, one a sum of, of discrete time sinusoids through 
an ideal d to c with some interpolation interval t sub s, you could do it term by term like before, or you could do the spectral thing, which is to look at the spectrum on minus pi to pi and do that substitution omega hat. Here's kind of a shortcut using spectra. And this is whether it's a shortcut is arguable, right? Like some people think of this as a shortcut. Some people think, oh, I like the other way better. But let me just show you via an example how this works using spectra to figure out y of t when x of n is a sum of sinusoids, discrete times sinusoids, and you get y of t by putting x of n through an ideal d to c with interpolation interval, say, t sub s, colon. Okay, here's the shortcut using spectra. All right. And it's best to follow this along by an example, but So what I'm going to do is say, suppose the spectrum of x of n looks like this on minus pi to pi. You find the spectrum of x of n on the interval minus pi less than or equal to omega hat less than or equal to pi, and you graph it. It'll look like this. for example. So here's omega hat space, and let's put pi out here, 0 here, and minus pi out here. Say your spectrum of, of x of n looks like, say, this. Say it has a, a stem of height, say, 3 at omega hat equals 0, and then it has, like, a, say, 5 e to the minus j pi over 4 at omega hat equals, say, pi over 3. And because it has that, what do we know? It has to have another one over here at minus pi over 3 with complex conjugate label. Let's make it 5 halves e to the plus j pi over 4. And maybe it has one out here at, say, 3 fourths pi of height 7 halves. Let's make this three halves. <laughs> so that. And it's going to be with e to the positive j pi over 5, say. So it has to have one out here. And so this is going to be 3 pi over 4 of the same height. Complex conjugate label. OK. Suppose your spectrum looks like this. And notice that uh, this the important features of the spectrum are that you have stems, they all point up, their lengths are equal to their magnitudes, and they're conjugate symmetric. If there's one over here at 3 fourths pi, there has to be one at minus 3 fourths pi, and its label has to be the conjugate of the label of that. Anyway, that's what the spectrum of x of n is going to look like on minus pi to pi once you've graphed it. How do you find y of t? You, do a, you, you write these out as cosines and then do a simple substitution. Okay, so to find the y of t, You put the pairs together, this is one way to find it, and do a simple substitution. You can proceed in one of two ways. OK, so method one, is First, write, so there's method one. This feels like a really cookbooky kind of lecture. I'm giving you recipes for finding this and methods for finding that, whatever. First, write x of as of cosines less than pi. How do we do that from this picture? Tell me what the terms are. x of n equals, it's going to be three terms. 
Anybody care to give me the three terms if that's what the spectrum of x, x of n looks like on minus pi to pi? Three, three halves maybe, three halves. <laughs> All right, three halves. <laughs> Very good, plus, and you said five times what? So five cosine. cosine. Negative, well, no, pi over three. okay, cosine maybe n pi over 3? And then what's the phase? Minus yeah, excellent. Okay, very good. And that corresponds to the pair of stems at plus and minus pi over 3. And the other pair of stems gives us 7, ha seven cosine of n pi, n 3 pi over 4 minus or plus pi over 5. Okay? Now we do a simple substitution. Okay? We do a simple substitution. So on each term, by means of the relationship 2 pi f 0 t s equals, equals omega 0 hat. Okay. So on this term, the omega hat is zero is going to be zero. On this term, it's going to be pi over three. On that, that term, it's going to be three pi over four. And we get if say t sub s equals ten to the minus fourth again, and f sub s is equal to ten to the fourth. What happens here is you get on this term. 2 pi times f0 times 10 to the minus fourth equals pi over 3 implies that this is equal to f0 is equal to 1 6 times 10k and 2 pi f0 10 to the minus fourth is equal to pi over 3 pi over 4 is going to this is going to be 3 eighths times 10 to the fourth, right? And then write down x of t as follows. x of t is just going to be same amplitudes cosine 2 pi times whatever f0 you came up with, so it's going to be 1 6 times 10 to the fourth. t, same phase. Like so. OK, so that's method one. Oh, I forgot the t here. There. That's method one for finding y of t, not x of t, in that picture over there. What's the other method? The other method is to take this picture, the spectrum of x of n on minus pi to pi, and do the straight up substitution 2 pi f, f t s equals omega hat right away on that picture. And you're going to end up with the spectrum of y of t. So there's method two. Start with that spectral picture. Start with spectrum. Of x of n on minus pi less than or equal to omega hat less than or equal to pi. Rescale the omega hat axis by means of the substitution 2 pi f t s equals omega hat. And what will result is the spectrum of y of t. So let's carry that out.
for t sub s equals 10 to the minus fourth again. So carry this out for t sub s equals 10 to the minus fourth and f sub s equals 10 to the fourth. Take that picture over there, and we rescale the omega hat axis by means of the substitution 2 pi fts equals omega hat. That's going to mean 2 pi f times is equal to 10 to the fourth omega hat, or f equals omega hat times 10 to the fourth over 2 pi, something like that, right? So the picture over there is going to turn into a picture of stems versus f. 0 stays where it's at. But when I rescale by this f equals that, omega hat equals pi over 4 becomes 1 eighth times 10 to the fourth, or 1 s wait a second. Is that a pi over 4 or pi over 3? Oh, yeah, there we go. One sixth times 10 to the fourth. Good. I, I thought I knew that was not supposed to be. And the stem stays the same, except it's, it's there. So the same label, which is going to be a 5 halves e to the minus j pi over 4. And omega hat equals 3 pi over 4. When I do this substitution, it goes out to be 3 eighths of 10 to the fourth and 7 halves e to the positive j pi over 5. Is that right? Yep. And it, the conjugate symmetric things do what they're, they have to do. OK. And this picture here versus f, this stem plot, is the spectrum of y of t. So this is 5 halves e to j pi over 4. So in, we skip the intermediate step of writing the x of n as a sum of discrete time cosines. And instead, we went right to work on the spectrum and got the spectrum of y of t. And you can just read off y of t from this using what you know about continuous time sinusoids. y of t equals what we got earlier, 3 halves plus 5 cosine of 1 6 times 10 to the fourth 2 pi times that, et cetera. There we go. Same thing. So those are two methods. So Nick asked us before the break, Instead of graphing infinity stems, what do we do? Well, we graph it on minus pi to pi. Here's one reason why you might want to do that. It's easy to figure out what comes out of the ideal d to c from the graph of the spectrum on minus pi to pi. And you can do it by either of these two methods. And some people think of this as a shortcut. And certainly, it, wor it works as a shortcut if, you're, if you were given the spectrum to begin with for finding out what comes out of these ideal d to c's when you drive them with sums of, of discrete time sinusoids. So pretty much that's all the details and the wrap up on chapter four material. And so I'm just going to pause there and see if, if anyone wants to ask any questions on this stuff before we, before we start talking about FIR systems, which is the topic of chapter five. And by the way, this is, like I said, I would tell you today. This is the wrap. This is the end of what's covered on the first prelim. So, end prelim one coverage. Okay. So, begin class ended by end prelim one coverage error message. That's what we're going to get here, right? Begin course. Did we ever have a begin course instruction even? 
So this will be, uh, yeah, no. Should have done that first day of school. Okay, so, so this, any questions on this? Any questions on anything up to now that, that's been bugging you over the long weekend? Or even just today? They sent us a, I don't know if you know this, but the associate dean for undergraduate programs, along with the teaching coach in people in the engineering college, send us these messages, you know, teaching tip of the week or teaching tip of the month or whatever, you know. And the most recent one was how to handle that awkward change of topic, you know, like. <laughs> so here's a suggestion. How about, uh, you know, like ask them for questions or. Make it clear that you're changing topics. You're moving on to a new subject. You know, I, there was all re like really obvious stuff, in my humble opinion. But stuff we we already do in this class. So, but if I'm doing a bad job of that, Nick, let me know. One question I do have is, when are we are we going to talk about the Pepsi boundary pictures at some point? You're going to get a handout that that talks about them, but we need to know more, unfortunately, to to do it right. Like, Alex bugged me no end two years ago you know when are we going to hear about the pesky boundary cases <laughs> you know he got the hand up after his finals. no <laughs> no <laughs> not true not true I can check. you can double check well i gave it i gave it before the final last semester but <laughs> we need we need to talk about something called the discrete time fourier transform okay the dtft and that's not even chapter f five that's like chapter you know, we need to know about frequency response. We need to know all these things to make it coherent, okay? So you don't have to check. <laughs> anyway. No, but he was, he was, the, he was the nebbish bugging me about, about the, uh, you know, pesky boundary case handout for a long time last time. But, but they did get it eventually, you know. And, yeah, it's mostly a conscious, conscious, conscience-relieving exercise. But just a preview of, of one thing that comes up there, like the, the pesky boundary case for the wheel, right, where your mind can't decide. If you do the math on that case, you find out that the, the signal that comes out of the ideal D to C, the magic box, is one half of clockwise rotation plus one half of counterclockwise rotation, interestingly enough. So that one looks like it's just not spinning at all? Yeah. It, well, not spinning at all is when it's being strobed, but when it's going half a rev every frame, your brain can't decide between, you might have been gone that day, but I, told, I said to the class, it's kind of like a Necker cube, where if I draw this cube on the board here, then if you stare at that, then sometimes this face will seem like the one that's out of the board sometimes, and your brain flip-flops between those two. The same thing happens with the wheel, but if you do the math on the wheel example, then it turns out that the actual signal that you're quote-unquote building is one half clockwise plus one half counterclockwise. So anyway. Wait, I'm like a wheel stick. Can I kind of correct that? I don't know. I, I mean, no. I don't think there is a way to correct it. Where were we talking? Were, was it in here we were talking about like uh, super fast films that look too real, like they filmed Lord of the Rings? Yeah, yeah that was, that was you. During the break. Yeah, yeah, during the break. Yeah, the, anyway. So yeah, you'll get a handout eventually. Maybe after the final, but you know. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, yeah, so it was after the last day of classes, but before the final. Yes, exactly, it was. <laughs> That's exactly when it was. Very good. But last semester, they got it like the last week of classes, I think, so. All right, any other questions on this? Everybody feels like they're, you're not done yet. You know, it's, it's only 12.52. Uh, I have three minutes to tell you stuff. The clock is wrong, again? 12.53. Oh, okay. Well, uh, how about this? How about I, I give you two minutes today and maybe I'll keep you two minutes late some other day. How about that? No, we only have one minute now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So. <laughs>
how to handle that awkward change in topics.